I'm wondering if there's any more famous piece of Scripture than Psalm 23. I mean, maybe it's the the Shema, right? Our, the Lord our God is one God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. That's 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 pretty well known. Uh, the Lord's Prayer. Maybe maybe the Beatitudes. The blessed are those. Blessed are those. Surely John three sixteen is in the running. People see that anywhere from preaching their service to on the cardboard at football games when we had fans. Uh, the stories of the, ex- of the Exodus or the resurrection of Christ might be more well-known stories. When it comes to an actual text, Psalm 23 is recognizable by people from all walks of life, for sure. I wonder why that is. Here's my answer. Funerals. Psalm 23 is pretty well-known because of funerals. Think about it. You, uh, you walk into the church building or into the funeral home or whatever place that it is, and you're probably handed a, a folded piece of paper. You sit down, either alone or with your family or friends, and you begin to peruse that document in your hand, and maybe on the inside flap or the back page, behold, there it is, Psalm 23. Uh, a Christian or not, the tradition and familiarity of the rod and the staff comforting you in the valley of the shadow of death certainly is reassuring. The hope of dwelling in the house of the Lord forever is at its worst an emotional solace in the midst of Greece, and at best it's the hope of those who grieve equipped with the truth of everlasting life. Believing in God's all-powerful hand, guiding every step of humanity, and desiring all people to be saved, it's not surprising that this would be a text of choice for funerals, as so many people will hear the truth of Christ through it. God is faithful to call all people unto salvation at any time, in any place, under any circumstance. But there's nothing in or around this text that tells us the author intended this for a funeral. So I'm, I'm hedging my bet there must be a deeper reason for it than either our emotional comfort or our cultural tradition or, or even a vague hope for what our agnostic world deems as impossible to know. There is a deeper reason for Psalm 23. It's a real relationship with the almighty God of the world, of the universe, that comes through knowing. This relationship comes through knowing who He is and knowing your need to follow and surrender and be led by the Great Shepherd. So we need to read this divinely historic passage with fresh eyes of faith this particular morning. Eyes of faith that are open to see God as the great shepherd of your soul. And eyes of faith that see your need for that great shepherd. So I'm going to ask that you follow along as I read this morning. And I'm fully aware of the texts that say I I should not add or subtract from the word of God. I'm not going to do that this morning. But while I read it, there's going to be a few places where I sort of add some questions just to make sure your mind and heart is engaged in what the text is saying. So follow along as I read. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down. Where? In green pastures. He leads me. Where? Beside still waters. It's there, the green pastures and the still waters, that he restores my soul. He leads me in what? In paths of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For your rod, 
and your staff, they comfort me, which is not the verse. But you are, you, the reason you feel evil is because the Lord is with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They're the tools of guidance and protection. They comfort me. You prepare a table for me. Where? In the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness, God's great love, and mercy, God's great compassion, shall follow me for how long? All the days of my life. And I shall dwell, where? In the house of the Lord. For how long? Forever. It's important this morning. It's, it's, it's essential this morning that you see the great shepherd. Right? There are many images that help us to understand who the Lord is. His name could be sufficient enough. Yahweh, the God of Israel. Uh, his name is synonymous with the promise. I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. I will be your God and you will be my people. I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is the promise of God. He's unique in these promises. There's not another God like Yahweh God. He says it. It's a covenant promise and he keeps it no matter what. And still the revelation of God, the scriptures, the Bible, it gives us more. He gives us God as Father. God as judge, God as creator. The scriptures tells us that he's a friend of sinners, that Christ is the son of God, that he's the bread, that he's the light, that he's the way. But in this passage, in Psalm 23, King David, with with no particular historical reference point, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, calls the Lord his shepherd. Now, David has worked as a shepherd. He knows what that job is like. And many of his readers would be familiar either by occupation or association of what it means to be a shepherd of sheep. And even in the, maybe in the business world of that time period, right, the, the, the sheep are sort of the, the glory of that shepherd, right? Or the owner of that shepherd, he, he might be sitting there, he, might, might, he or she might be sitting there saying, look at, look at all my sheep on the hills and the valleys. Look how many they are. Look how well fed and protected they are by all my under shepherds. I, I, have, I haven't lost a sheep in, in years. My, my, the percentage of sheep that I lose is super low. Look at all that wool that's going to provide for me and my family. Look, look how well we're going to eat in the future. Lamb. Shank, lamb kebabs, lamb chops, rack of lamb. Yeah, those are my sheep. And they reveal the glory of my shepherding. Even David himself gives credit to the Lord for giving both the lion and the bear into his hand in protection of the flocks that he had as a youth. But you may not be so familiar with shepherding itself since our suburban life uh, does not typically include agriculture on a large scale or shepherding. But even if you only read this particular passage, you you can learn a few things. Uh, The shepherd provides for his sheep what the sheep most need. Food, rest, protection. And it's here that David, as the sheep, he doesn't want. He's lying down in green grasses of winter and spring. He's finding rest for his body, nutrition for his stomach. He's led beside still waters. Sheep don't swim very well, if at all. And it's scary to drink from some place that might drown you. So swift and raging waters are never safe for a sheep. And the Lord lays David down beside the still waters. Parts of David's life are filled with circumstances that would drown him if not for the Lord's providing stillness in his soul. Yet David is more than an animal and needs more than a physical sustenance, and his shepherd delivers. His his soul is restored. 
His mind is clear. His hope is sure regardless of circumstance. And this makes him an obedient participant when the shepherd calls to lead him. He guides David down paths of righteousness. I'm sorry, David's righteousness? Uh, David the adulterer. Uh, David the deceitful? Uh, David the murderer? He leads that guy down righteousness path? Yes. Yes, he does. For the sake of Yahweh's great name, for the fulfillment of Yahweh's great promise, he leads David down a path that he could not walk, much less find, on his own. And even if he was able to find it, he probably wouldn't choose it. Nobody chooses a path of righteousness that would go through the valley of the shadow of death. We would take the easy road. That deep valley with thick forest that blocks the sun. Home to enough predators licking their chops, the defenseless single-file line of cotton candy walking along the hillside. Are the sheep ignorant or senseless or prideful in walking in such a place? No more than the Israelites walking through the Red Sea. Even as the cloud protected them from Pharaoh's army, so the rod of protection and staff of correction are reminder that the shepherd's presence is with them, never leaving, never forsaking. These are the benefits of the shepherd providing and guiding and protecting. His sheep are safe. But again, there's, there's something deeper in the text. Look again at the actions that the shepherd provides there in verse 2. He makes the sheep lie down. He leads them to still waters for drink. He leads them to paths of righteousness for His name's sake. It's there in the valley of the shadow of death that He restores the soul. And so when we get there, we're sure we're not talking about sheep anymore. Sheep don't have a soul. They have a stomach for sure and emotions at base level, but, but no soul for God awareness and everlasting communion. Our souls grow weary because circumstance disappoints. This world leaves us confused and wanting. Hunger and thirst can cause a soul to fear and real solitude make a soul despair but he does for us the great shepherd does for us what we cannot do for ourselves even as creation made in his image in his perfect power he makes and he leads and he comforts and he restores he exchanges fear for assurance and despair for hope he is the great shepherd of souls so much so that he prepares a table a table of hope and a table of victory the enemies will be forced to gaze upon the riches of Yahweh's kindness toward his children as long as they long for for that that they long for that moment that, that what they've rejected in every moment prior the enemies long for this good shepherd but they refuse it and do not get a seat at the table it is yahweh the king of kings and the god of gods who prepares this feast and then invites david king david the lesser King David the guest, King David the son, into his presence. Anoints him with oil. Keeps his glass full to the brim. Verse 5 becomes very important. Because now there's a relationship, there's a picture of relationship between these two parties, this preparing a table in the presence of enemies. 
This goes beyond shepherd and sheep. Yet all the necessity and benefit of the shepherd remain. Why? If I'm not a sheep, why do I need a shepherd? If you are not a sheep, why do you need a shepherd? Well, let's let's go back to the funeral for a moment, can't we? You sat down, you perused the worship guide, you read the text. What came to your mind when you read Psalm 23? Hmm, they, they use that psalm too. Just like the last funeral I went to. Or maybe, man, I'm glad they used this great psalm. The idea of a shepherd leading us through this sad time, it's, it's really comforting. It's nice imagery. For such a sad time. Uh, Nana loved this psalm. I'm glad, I'm glad it's here. Whatever your thoughts might be, They're all simply just nice thoughts without understanding the purpose of the psalm. Because the psalm is meant to show you the sufficiency of the shepherd, the power of Yahweh God for your restoration and for your victory. And if you were to realize that without this shepherd, you would have none of it. None of the protection, none of the glory, none of the sustentation. If you realized in that moment that you would have none of the shepherd's protection and provision unless you were his, what would your heart and mind do at that point? You understand, in our pride of accomplishment, in our ignorance of the eternal, We honestly think that we are satisfied. From our hand and efforts and our can-do attitude, we believe we have all the green pastures we want, that we are beside truly still waters. We think our souls are restored and our righteousness is sufficient. In our arrogance, in our ignorance, we don't fear death because either this world is all there is or by our own goodness, there's enough for whatever it is that comes next. Your table. Your table's just fine. It's it's fine the way you set it. There's plenty in your cup. Your enemies are not part of your equation at all. And quite frankly, the idea of oil on your head just makes you sort of want a napkin to wipe it off before you eat. You read this psalm and it's nice, but you, your life is fine and you've never had a shepherd. So the psalm then isn't necessary. So allow me to ask you a question or two. just to see if it might wake your conscience a little bit this morning. Why weren't you or me born in a war-torn country? Or even born during an age and a time of war in this country? Why are your checkups still clear from disease when others your ages aren't? And and what will you do when yours doesn't come back clean? Your family's together. Your spouse has not left you. Your kids have not rebelled. Is, is that due to your goodness alone? Is that due to the collective whole of your community? Any answer. Any answer that lacks a divine shepherd either have to do with chance or the collective good. But those answers are really insufficient when you are, in fact, walking through the valley of the shadow of death. 
You want to know what that's like? You want to know what the valley of the shadow of death feels like? Watch the news of war-torn countries. Watch the Free Burma Rangers video. And then tell me about the collective good of humanity. Go to Uganda with our church. And attempt to give hope to the sick with chance. Or see if there's enough collective good in the ministry that we sponsor, in SOS Ministries, to take care of the entire nation. Can you go to the brokenhearted of the broken home and look them square in the eye and say with all the compassion that you possibly can muster up, it is what it is. I'm sorry is what you say. You listen, and then you say, I'm sorry, because the hurt and the anger and the brokenness and blame reveals something is desperately wrong with our souls. And our souls need an answer for what's wrong. You watch the news or watch the videos, and you're disturbed because of the violence and because of the anger and because of the determination to control another people. You hear medical calamities, and you, and, and it, you're amazed at all the science and all the technology, and yet you're more amazed that you can't fix what's going wrong. We walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Here's the hard truth, church. What's wrong is staring at us in the mirror. And that image that you see is to be shepherded by another, not by yourself. Because if you, if you are determined to not be shepherded by the great shepherd and and shepherded by yourself, you need to hear this this morning. You're actually not shepherding yourself. As the Lord would have it in my quiet times this week, I'm I'm rolling, I'm I'm going through some of the Psalms. I'm 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 ahead of Psalm 23, and I I read Psalm 49, and, and verses 13 and 14 say this. It said, "This is the path of those who have foolish confidence. Yet after them, people approve of their boasts. Like sheep, they are appointed for shield." the Hebrew word for hell. Death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning. Their form shall be consumed in Sheol with no place to dwell. Here's the problem. There is the shepherd that gives life, but there is also a shepherd that will bring death, and everyone Everyone is being led. The great shepherd, God himself, Jesus Christ, is trying to reach you with his love to tell you he not only exists, but that he cares deeply about your soul and that he is willing to lead you. He wants to lead you and to guide you, not not like a genie that you control, but like a perfect shepherd who teaches who teaches you that what you most want and gives to you what you most want so that you won't want any more. Don't believe me? Look at the passage again. Just take your eyes and peruse Psalm 23. And as you look at it, What is the most repeated type of word in the passage? Don't say it out loud. Just look at it and stick your mind. What's the most repeated kind of word in the whole passage? You're exactly right. First person, personal pronouns. They're all over the place. There's 18 of them in six verses. 
I, me, my. There's, there's a possessive pronoun in, in, in verse 1 right there. The Lord is my shepherd. There's the, di- the directive in verse 2 and 3. He makes me. He leads me. He restores me. There's a descriptive in verse 4. I walk. I do not fear. Comforts me. There's the receptive pronouns. Prepare before me. Anoint my head. My cup overflows. Th- this is not language between man and his animal. This is language between God and his image bearers, between the king and his sons and daughters, between the all powerful and the all helpless. We don't use first person pronouns. Because these are the gods that we choose, but because God himself chooses us. We don't make him up. We ma- he makes us over. We don't trick him to serve us. He loves us, so we surrender to him. Followers of Christ are born again, not of the flesh, but of the spirit. Yahweh God is the one who leads us into righteousness and then follows it up with love and mercy. He knows that you and I cannot do it on our own. You and I cannot even believe good enough to follow Christ. Our faith needs his grace to wake us up to the reality, to convince us that it's true, that he's the savior of our souls, that he's the sustainer of our lives, that he's the one who carries us into glory. He's the great shepherd. He's the great shepherd. He's the great shepherd. It's a personal relationship. He's come for you for his glory. This is why some of those sweetest pronouns there in verses 4 and 6 where we fear no evil because as the, the King James Version reads, thou art with me and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Ah, oh, pastor, what's that look like? What does dwelling in the house of the Lord with the great shepherd look like? Fortunately for you, the scriptures has the answer. Revelation chapter 7, verses 15 through 17 says, Therefore, they, the great multitude, every tribe, tongue, and nation, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them With his presence. Hmm. Shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more. Green pastures. They shall thirst. They shall not thirst anymore. Still waters. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. Why? For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Oh, isn't that hopeful, church? Isn't that good news that the Lamb of God who sacrifices himself on the cross to save us from ourselves is the very one who is the great shepherd to lead us into everlasting life, to lead us into righteousness for his name's sake. Who is this great shepherd? It's Jesus Christ alone. He taught it to us in John chapter 10. He says, I'm the good shepherd. And the good shepherd, he lays down his life for the sheep. And then Jesus juxtaposes his shepherding with with any other shepherd that might be in terms of a hired hand. He says, he who is hired, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I do not know 
who is shepherding your soul this morning. But I want you to know, according to the Word of God, if it be earthly security, if it be the relationship of another, if it be self-confidence, if it be your past glory, I want you to know that shepherd, it's nothing more than a hired hand. And when the valley of the shadow of death comes, when the wolf comes, they will leave you because they are not God. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. If you trust in anything else this morning, stop. Repent. If you trust in anyone else this morning other than Jesus Christ, then call it for what it is, sin. Whether you trust in yourself or your job or your abilities or anything else or, or your history or your tradition or your, your, your faithfulness to the church, even if you're trusting in your faithfulness to the church, I want to tell you it won't save your soul. Repent of it. Call it what it is, sin, and say, Lord, I'm sorry. You alone are my shepherd. And follow. Submit. Surrender your life willfully, joyfully, gladly, knowing there is no other safe place than with the shepherd going before and his goodness and mercy coming behind.